Okay. Good afternoon. Um, so my name's Colin. I'm principal engineer um, on Elastic Load Balancing, which is a, a service hopefully every here is, everyone here is probably at least, at least a little bit familiar with. Uh, so I actually joined ELB about a year ago. Uh, I've worked at AWS uh, quite a bit longer than that, but I joined ELB about a year ago. Uh, spent the last year uh, not just working on ELB, but also meeting uh, a lot of our customers and figuring out how they use ELB, what we can do better for them, um, all those kinds of things. And pretty much everything that's in this presentation uh, comes from that. It comes from best practices that uh, I've learned from customers, how they're, how they're using ELB, the patterns they're applying, in, um, and how they're building it into their businesses. Uh, so we're going to cover that, and then we're going to cover some, uh, some deep dives into parts of the internal architecture of ELB, um, how we do some specific security things, how we manage our availability, things like that. So hopefully there'll be a lot to learn from. Um, just a very, very quick primer on Elastic Load Balancer. So we, uh, you create an Elastic Load Balancer. Uh, it has listeners. They listen on a TCP IP port pair, and they take traffic. Ordinarily, um, we'll terminate SSL as well for customers. Uh, that's pretty popular, where we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll do and manage the encryption. Um, and then you register instances or auto-scaling groups behind the load balancer, and we direct traffic to it. Right? So that's ELB at the very, very high level. Uh, but we're going to get into it in a lot more detail than that. And we're going to cover uh, three, uh, do it in three sections. Um, first is going to be security. So how ELB uh, provides and manages security for the applications that are behind it, um, and some of how we implement our own security features. Uh, the second thing we're going to cover is scalability, right? How ELB helps uh, you scale um, for uh, your numbers of requests, uh, whether it's very small numbers or very large numbers, whether it's low bandwidth or very high bandwidth. Uh, and finally, we're going to cover availability, how ELB integrates into keeping, um, keeping your installation online all the time. OK, so we'll start with security. Um, so uh, I want to emphasize that everything I'm going to cover here in the security section um, is true, independent of whether you use Elastic Load Balancer as a load balancer, right? So I'll give, I'll give you an example. I run my own personal just toy um, instance and website uh, on EC2. I have a t2.micro because um, I, I can't justify spending any more money than that on my, my own toy projects. And it's just got some very old blogs and, and, and things that uh, um, I just want to keep online, but I, it's not availability critical or anything like that. Um, but just for my own um, kind of peace of mind and ease of use, I actually run that, even though it's one instance, uh, behind an elastic load balancer. Um, and there's, um, now, partly that's because I work on ELB, and I want to be able to use it on a day-to-day -day basis and stay very familiar with how, how it works. But it's also partially because it's, it's doing things for me, like SSL, um, that I no longer have to worry about on the back end, and, and helps protect me from, from various threats. Um, so uh, one best practice when it comes to security stuff is, is to think about your threat model, right? What are, uh, what are the things we're defending against? Um, and there's some specific things that having that ELB helps us with here. Um, the, the three I've highlighted are um, defending against weaknesses in cryptographic protocols. So we'll go into that. Um, software vulnerabilities, so just vulnerability in the software that you might be running behind an ELB. Uh, explain a little, little bit how we help with that. And, and things like account disclosure, so just simple things like passwords and so on get lost. Right? And um, it, might, it might seem a little strange and unfamiliar that ELB can help with those things, but what I find out from talking to customers is that it's actually a really, really common, uh, a, a common reason why people are using ELB. Surprised me, so um, I thought it was worth going into here. Uh, so the first of those is probably uh, our most uh, popular feature and, um, and thing that we've seen the most activity on over the last 18 months in particular, which is SSL and defending against cryptographic vulnerabilities. So the, the last 18 months has seen a lot 
of uh, new research and progress in an the analysis of, of uh, encryption modes and the security properties of various uh, protocols, um, which is great. That's a really positive development. The people are really scrutinizing these things and finding every weakness that's there so that they can be improved. Uh, but it also means uh, we've had to turn around and respond very quickly uh, to each of those as they're found. So uh, by terminating SSL on the ELB, um, we manage all of that, right? So some, some examples of things that we've done there is uh, when the Poodle vulnerability came out, which essentially said that SSL v3 is no longer secure, so that came out in November last year. The, the very same day the paper was released and made public, we had a new ELB security policy to disable SSL v3. And that was our new default. If you created a new ELB that day, it would no longer have SSL v3. And we also encouraged all of our customers to, to uh, take their existing ELBs and migrate them to that policy. It's very easy to do. You can do it in the console very quickly or with our API. We saw very quick adoption with that. Um, you know, within a day or two, 62% of our ELBs had converted to that new security policy. And within a month, it was in the high 90s. Um, so we saw great adoption there. Uh, we also saw um, earlier this year the, the logjam vulnerability was disclosed, um, which was just improvements in how Diffie-Hellman encryption can be uh, attacked. And, and it was disclosed that you know, certain key sizes and so on were no, were no longer secure. And so we took a, uh, I took a very close look at that. Again, the same day it was released, we actually had new security policies available that just completely disabled uh, Diffie-Hellman encryption um, on your ELBs. Um, that's OK. Diffie-Hellman encryption uh, plays a role in what's called, called perfect forward secrecy. I'll talk about that in a few slides. Uh, but there's actually a much more modern uh, alternative available based on elliptic curves. Uh, and so we felt the, the most pragmatic thing to do was just turn off, uh, uh, turn off Diffie-Hellman. We released that policy that same day. And again, we saw a lot of people upgrading very quickly. Uh, when, when the Heartbleed software vulnerability uh, was disclosed against OpenSSL, Again, on the same day, we had upgraded every ELB uh, without downtime, which is uh, uh, pretty neat. Um, and it, not quite a clear you know, day on which the RC4 encryption algorithm was just simply declared insecure. It's more a thing that kind of gradually became consensus over a period of months and years. Um, we, had, we had removed the RC4 encryption algorithm uh, from our default security policies. Uh, quite, quite far in advance of it coming out of things like uh, the ratings tools that give you an SSL rating or uh, various um, compliance programs and so on. Uh, so we're doing, um, so we're keeping up to date with these policies, uh, essentially so you don't have to, right? So when one of these uh, things come out, um, switch your policy to the latest thing, um, and, and you should be, you should be in, a, in a pretty good position. Uh, one of the reasons we're able to do this and respond so quickly uh, to these things is um, we've actually been working uh, and released over the summer our own implementation of SSL and TLS. Um, so it's called S2N, which is short for signal to noise. It's on GitHub. You can go look at the code. You can see how the project's doing. Um, it's written in about uh, 5,000 5, lines of code. Uh, which compares to about uh, 150,000 lines of code uh, to do uh, the same functionality in, in OpenSSL. Uh, so we feel it's, it's, it's probably in a much better position against uh, security vulnerabilities and so on. Um, we're not using this yet in ELB. We're, we're going to take a very conservative approach to migrating the service over to it. We're going through a lot of extensive security reviews. Uh, we're, we're working with a lot of people in the community to, to analyze it as closely as possible. Um, but we'll be, we'll be uh, migrating AWS services, including ELB, to it. But in the meantime, it also means we have a, a deep expertise in SSL and TLS. We, we know it at the implementation level. And we're involved in the community. Um, you know, we attend uh, the things like the, the SSL standardization meetings and so on. Um, and so when these papers come out, we're pretty well positioned to make uh, judgments around um, what to do. Uh, I'll explain our thinking process there a little, right? So if you go to our console, if you go to um, our API, you'll see that we support these security policies, and we also have custom policies. 
So security policies are just a pre-baked set of policies. Here's the ciphers we support. Uh, our default is um, always a set that we think is um, balances trade-offs between uh, security and compatibility. And our custom one, you can, you can pick and choose whatever you like. You can literally go through uh, all of the various protocols that we support and decide which ones you, you want and don't want. Um, and so as I said, we're trying to manage and balance trade-offs between uh, security and compatibility, right? If we literally boiled everything down to just the absolutely most secure, um, you know, most CPU-intensive encryption algorithm, very, very few clients would work with that, right? And, and your sites and installations just wouldn't work. So that, that, that wouldn't be acceptable. And then on the other hand, if we just included everything, obviously there would be uh, insecure protocols and modes in there. Uh, so what we do is we take the set that's available, which is quite a lot, um, and we first pair it down to encryption algorithms that are secure at all. So today, in our default policies, we support uh, AES and 3DES encryption. Um, and then we always, always, always prefer perfect forward secrecy. So what that means is if that's an encryption mode where even if your certificate was somehow compromised, even if the private key leaked, you know, even if somebody lost it, it was on a USB drive some, somewhere or something, um, somebody who got that key wouldn't be able to go back and decrypt any of your traffic that they had previously collected, right? So that's a really, really good mode to operate in. So we always, always prefer that. And we see, um, you know, today, thanks to uh, browsers, which uh, all have adopted this now, uh, we see if, you're, if your clients are generally browsers, you know, way into the 90s percent of traffic now uses perfect forward secrecy, which is great. After that, uh, we, we always prefer AES, the encryption, uh, the AES encryption algorithm, um, uh, over 3DES, which is the other one we support in our default. Some of our policies still include ORC4, not our default policy. We wouldn't recommend using those policies unless you need them for um, extreme backwards compatibility reasons. But even in those cases, we deprioritize RC4 all the way down. Um, and then there's things called authentication modes, which are just around making sure the traffic um, can't be forged or tampered with uh, on, the, on the wire. Um, and there's several different modes in these protocols. We use GCM, which is a Galois counter mode. Uh, that's a preferred mode. That's the, the, the most modern, most secure mode uh, over CBC and HMAC. Uh, so we always prefer those. And then what we do is we take those sets of our proposed, okay, here's what we think we should do, right? And we simulate what would happen with that set of cipher suites against literally billions of connections from real world clients that are hitting sites like Amazon.com, right? So we, uh, we, we have systems and measurement processes set up where we can take a look and we can say, okay, we wanna take this cipher out is that gonna be safe? Are we gonna drop so much traffic that it's gonna cause uh, any availability issues? Or is pretty much everything out there, it already has the more modern things and it's gonna be fine, right? Um, so that's a process. Uh, some legacy clients can like, cause trickiness there. Thankfully, we don't see this a lot, right? If, you're, if your clients are mostly uh, phones, right, or browsers, everything's really up to date, right? We see a lot, you know, great. Uh, software update, uptake uh, rate with those. Uh, but if, you're, if your clients are, you know, embedded systems, firmwares on televisions, uh, things that were, you know, shipped six years ago and nobody thought to include an auto-update mechanism, then it may still only support, you know, SSL v3 and so on. So in, the, in those cases, you can take a really close look and you can say, well, the traffic I'm sending you know, there's no credit card data, there's no password data. Um, it's probably okay to still use uh, those protocols in, 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 in those cases. Uh, you, can, you can run on an old uh, security policy if you, if you really, really choose to. Um, we'd always recommend our most recent, which is 2015-05. Um, um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how you can go about making that analysis if you are in one of those um, kind of corner cases. Um, so there's a long-standing feature ELB has, which is access logs, right? Great feature, I'd always recommend turning it on. Uh, we'll we'll uh, talk a, a little more about it in detail later. But essentially, we log every request 
that we see, um, in, and we've a bunch of parameters that we record for each one, and we'll upload it to S3 periodically, right? Uh, it's, uh, we, we have uh, partner integrations, so you can take it from S3 and, and uh, feed it into our various partners, and they can uh, provide you with nice ways to analyze that data and various uh, GUIs and analytics and so on, which is really, really cool. But uh, two weeks ago, we released um, two new fields that we, we now record in the access logs, uh, which is we actually record the, the SSL cipher suite that was negotiated by the client for this request and the protocol version, right? So if in future you, you're having to sit down and think, you know, I need to disable, say, TLS 1.0, Right? because maybe the next PCI certification requires me to, well, I want to, I want to make an informed decision about what impact that's going to have on my user base. Right? Am I going to drop an unacceptable percentage of my clients? Um, and so you can now do that with the logs. Right? You, can, um, you can look at the, uh, we, we always prioritize things so that the least secure protocols come last. Right? That's, that's what that prioritization process achieves. Uh, so you can look at the logs and you can say, well, how many clients are still using TLS 1.0, even, even though it's very last in the list, right? So you know if you turned it off, they wouldn't be able to connect anymore. And you can do a you know, request by request analysis. You can look at the user agents and you can say, that's these clients. I need to get them to upgrade. Or that's this customer of mine. I need to talk to them. Um, and so you can gauge the impact uh, before it happens, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, so, I actually did this exercise um, with a customer a few months ago where we were, we were turning off SSL v3. And we were worried. We were, because our, our first kind of pass, our naive analysis, showed that um, almost a percent, 0.8% of traffic was still coming in over SSL v3. And for them, 0.8% of traffic is a lot. They didn't, they didn't want to just lose it. Um, and uh, so we went through the logs. They're, they had turned on access logs. Um, and we went through those access logs with them, one by one, and we found that actually the clients were uh, web scrapers. Um, it was nuisance robot traffic uh, that had been just running on bots and so on for years, and no one was keeping them up to date. And they were, they were actually pleased to block them. They, they, they were, became enthusiastic. It's like, no, no, let's turn off SSL v3 now. We don't, we, we're always trying to find creative ways to keep the, the web scrapers away. So that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, so access logs also form a part of how um, people are applying ELB as a form of uh, network compartmentalization. And so uh, with ELB, you can, you can spin up ELBs in uh, VPCs. So VPC is a virtual private cloud uh, where you can have your own data center in the cloud. And uh, you can spin up public ELBs that have public IP addresses that take internet traffic, right? Those are your front-end ELBs. Um, and we support private ones, too, uh, where they have internal IP addresses. Uh, and we can balance traffic from either of those to, to instances and so on. Um, but what we're seeing is um, people setting up ELBs or, or their uh, policies such that you know, their public subnet can only be ELBs, right? So that all front-end traffic, everything that comes in from the internet, has to at least go through an ELB. And, and uh, the effect of that is that they have a, a, a certain form of governance or, or, or firewalling on the traffic. So ELBs are inbound only, right? Inbound, we'll, we'll take traffic from the internet, we'll pass it on to the instances, but there's, there's, there's no way to go the other way. So if all you can provision in your public subnet is ELBs, that gives you a layer, de layer of defense against uh, things like data exfiltration or, or, or just somebody spinning up an instance in the public subnet and now it has full internet access and so on. But then they, they can also be set up with uh, access logs enabled and on various other kinds of logging enabled to really scrutinize the traffic as it comes in. Um, there's a few things uh, that it can do. Right. So uh, the first is just regular VPC security group integration. So you can set up security group rules on the ELBs, the front-end ELBs, uh, to say, here's where I want traffic to be permitted from. Um, we, um, this can all be locked down using our identity and access management um, systems with role accounts, such that 
um, you know, you can bless or, or provide a policy that says this particular role account and only this particular role account can uh, access the ELB API, can create ELBs in the public subnet, nothing else can create uh, public IPs in the public subnet. So therefore, only the people with that role account, which might be people in the security department or um, somebody with a privileged level of access, uh, can, um, can give that front-end access, can do things like load the SSL certificate, right? So, uh, and they don't need to use a password, right? They can set it up with tokens and so on because it's uh, a more security-sensitive operation. And so the effect of that straight away is that now, anything that's happening in your private subnets, it's a little easier to be more liberal about, right? People can spin up instances there and um, get, get their work done without risk, having to risk, you know, exposing some new public endpoint or some new SSL certificate and so on. Um, if the account uh, were to uh, be compromised in some way, this, this very privileged account um, somehow, if it was using a password and the password was simply lost and so on, we do support cloud trail logging. So every action in ELB, creating a new ELB and so on, it shows up in the cloud trail log. Um, so you can, be, you can see what's going on. Uh, we, we have ELB's own access logging, which we just covered. And, um, and if you're really super interested, you can also enable VPC flow logging and see literally every packet that comes into uh, the ELB. Uh, and um, like why it might be getting dropped if a security group is dropping it and so on. Um, and so the effect of all that, right, is that we're protecting against cryptographic weaknesses using the mechanisms and policies. Um, the software vulnerabilities one is a little more interesting. So because, it, because everything is going through the ELB and being access logged, it, and then being um, uploaded, by us um, to, to S3, uh, if there is a software vulnerability in the code on your instance, right? So, you know, I'm just running my blog on my instance, and I'm not always keeping my blog software up to date because I just forget to. And occasionally there's some vulnerability in there where, you know, they can, the attacker can post a URL and they get database access or system access and so on, and they get onto my box. And the first thing they'll do is delete the logs that are on my box, right? They want to cover their, own, uh, cover their own tracks. Well, because the ELB logged it separately, now we have a record. Actually, here's where the attacker came in. Here's the request they made. Here's what their IP address was, and so on. Uh, so it makes it easier to defend things against. Um, and account disclosure we cover via IAMS. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So that's, that's security. Um, and I want to move on to scalability. So fundamentally, uh, what I think of scalability, what I, what I think it's about, is, is speed, right? It's about maintaining an acceptable level of um, latency or uh, smoothness of operation or consistency of operation towards end users as the load increases. And so in systems theory, and in uh, kind of the academic ways of modeling uh, large systems, we, we generally model load and systems and servers and all those things using queuing theory, right, using queues. And um, probably the most fundamental kind of foundational theorem of, of queuing theory is Little's Law. That's L-I-T-T-L-E. I'm, I'm from Ireland, so my T's don't come out all the time. But, um, and, and what that says, essentially, is that in a long-running system or a system that's uh, uh, saturated, there's various technicalities, um, the overall uh, number of um, um, operations in the system or people in the system, or we, will call, we would call load or capacity, is just equal to the rate of arrival uh, times the average wait time, right? And we can flip those terms around um, because we're more interested in the wait time. That's what we're trying to optimize. Um, and put it in simpler terms, all it's really saying is that if your system can be modeled like a queue, which these systems can be, we're saying that latency um, is, is proportionate to um, the total load that you're uh, receiving 
divided by the throughput you can do, right? So the more throughput you can do, uh, the lower your latencies, right? Really straightforward, um, really obvious when, when, when put like that. Um, and, um, but not only are you know, systems and servers and instances modelable as queues, um, an ELB is itself model, uh, modelable as a queue, and, uh, and you could break down a system further and you could say inside a system, uh, that's several queues because each CPU has its own queue and it's this very um, complicated recursive pattern, but it still ultimately boils down to um, the faster your systems are responding, uh, the more users they can do per second, the lower your latencies will be, the more consistent they will be. Really, really straightforward. But we're gonna see how we ex exploit that law in low balancing to kind of smooth over common issues. Um, so there's three common patterns that um, kind of fight us here, that make latency um, harder than it should be, right? Really, really common in a lot of systems. Um, the first one I wanna highlight is garbage collection, right? So this is just a, a graph of uh, a typical memory usage on a system, let's say a JVM or a Ruby process or even a PHP process um, uh, where it'll allocate memory and it'll use more and more memory over time. All these objects are being allocated as, uh, by the code um, as it's executing and it's uh, running whatever service or website it is you're, you're providing. And at some point it reaches some magic limit and the system kicks in and decides to perform garbage collection and free up some of that memory, right? And we'll typically see a pause in performance at that point, right? We've seen systems with heaps and uh, garbage collection parameters set so large that you know, literally the memory can just accrue for gigs and gigs for days and days and days and then finally garbage collection kicks in and the system pauses literally for minutes, right? Not, not even milliseconds, but uh, re really hard pauses. So the system can be very, very variant just due to garbage collection. Um, pretty much all modern programming languages the code we use is written in are garbage collected. Uh, it's a very convenient pattern for, for uh, developers. I mean, I love to use it. Um, it's, uh, it's something a lot of research goes into to tune garbage collection, but we still see this property a lot, right? So this is fighting us, right? Occasionally systems will just pause, and that obviously has an impact of latency. Um, the second thing we see is caching, right? So caching is pretty pervasive in, in modern systems architectures, right? We even have our own caching services that we provide and people use. Uh, and caches are a great way to speed up most technical problems, right? They're, they're great, great things. Uh, but they also lead to this variance in performance where you know, everything is a cache hit, cache hit, cache hit, cache hit. And then all of a sudden you get a cache miss because finally your cache entry expires and uh, your latency goes through the roof because now you gotta go do the work to, to generate that entry that was cached. Right? Maybe you gotta query a database or figure out some, some workload or access disk when ordinarily it wouldn't. Um, and so this is a very similar looking graph to the previous one, right? You just have these long periods of everything being relatively okay and low latency, and then all of a sudden you've got uh, a big spike and it can hurt. And then the third thing is just kind of the natural distribution of workload and response time in, in any given system. Uh, so in general, pretty much any system I've measured follows an exponential distribution where your most requests are small, right? Vast majority of requests take a small number of milliseconds. Um, but there's, there are mixed in there a long tail of uh, larger workloads. And all that's really going on is, you know, you've got a bunch of small requests, things like get slash, which just retrieves the home page, might just be a static page, or a very simple front page where all the objects are cached, it's accessed so frequently that everything's hot, and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty quick and responsive. But then you might have another URL on the same system where, you know, here we're getting the monthly report, right? And maybe the monthly report needs to go query, you know, several million rows in a database somewhere and do some kind of pivot join on it, and, a lot of memory allocation and figure out what the report should look like for the month. 
And someone only calls it once a month, so it's not worth optimizing. Right? It's not worth fixing it so that it's much, much faster. But it ends up mixed in there. Right? And so we get this property where you know, a server, the reason we can model it as a queue is because really, in, in raw physics terms, it can only do one thing at a time. Right? Ultimately, there's a CPU down there that's doing some work, can only do one thing at a time, and there's a scheduler and queue managers and so on that are figuring out what it's allowed to do at any given time. And so queues build up, right? In, in the case of a server, you've got a scheduling queue. You've also got an accept backlog of requests that are pending and so on. And things just have to wait on each other, right? So you can sometimes end up with small requests having to wait on big requests to finish. And so when you do the math and you take um, this distribution, which we looked at, which is just a plot of you know, request size versus how common they are, or request load versus how common they are, you do the math and you turn that into a probability distribution of like what's the average wait time for a request, it ends up looking like this. right? It's just kind of a uh, pretty gentle curve. And, and says, most requests don't have to wait too long. Right? They're probably small. There's probably only some other small requests in front of them. But occasionally, there'll be a big request in front of me, and I got to gotta wait. So if you just had one server, one big server, that's what your load plot would look like. Right? And you'll see, um, you know, you'll see reasonable average um, response times. They'll probably be reasonably, reasonably close to the fast response times. But your higher percentile response times, so say your 99th percentile, will probably be quite high. Right? So if you've got just one server, one thing managing a request to it, and your average request time is, say, 10 milliseconds, uh, your, P your P99 is probably over 100, maybe even over a second. Wouldn't be unusual for this kind of plot. Uh, so the first thing we can do right, with load balancing to fix this, well, increase capacity, but we want to scale horizontally because we, we can't just build infinitely bigger and bigger uh, boxes. So um, we, we split the requests across uh, multiple hosts, right? And so here, uh, uh, these, it's, it's kind of a weighted round robin style load balancing. There's not, nothing smart going on other than we're saying, okay, we've got four instances. I'm going to take a request, and it's got a one in four chance of going to any particular server, and I'm just kind of allocate it there, more or less at random, okay? I like to think about this uh, like a supermarket checkout, right? Because you've got multiple checkouts, and you pick one, and you know, well, if you go to my supermarket, odds are there's someone with a really big load in front of you uh, all the time, and you're just going to have to wait on them to finish. Um, but even if you just do that, right? Even if all you do is increase the number of instances and split things at random, um, it improves things dramatically. So that curve I showed you, that's uh, that's the the dotted orange one. Uh, becomes the green one, right? Everything pulls in a little, which means your average goes down, right? your average response time gets much better, um, but more importantly, your P99s, um, uh, those, that higher percentile of, of response times uh, gets dramatically better quickly. And all we've done here is, is done some simple weighted round robin uh, load balancing. So this is actually the mode we operate in if you're using ELB as a TCP load balancer. So if you, if you terminate TCP on us, TCP directly on us, uh, you can enable SSL if you want. That still works. We'll still, still manage the SSL for you. Um, um, we, we will act as a weighted round robin load balancer towards the back ends. And this is the kind of improvement that you'll see. Right? Uh, so it's, it's pretty good and pretty dramatic. Uh, but we can do better again. right? Um, so if we try to line things up, so that instead of like the checkout queue, it's more like the queue at a bank, right? Where everybody lines up in one line and then takes the next server available. Th that's a more optimal strategy. Now, key to success here, right, is that the thing doing the dispatching, which in our case is ELB, is not itself the bottleneck, right? If it was the bottleneck, this wouldn't work. So it has to be faster at processing things than the instances are. Um, now, that's true in our case because you know, ELB, when we take a request and we go to direct and figure out where it should be, we're, not, you know, we're, we're making a very simple decision around here's where it should go next. We can do that quite quickly. We're not having to actually generate a page. right? We're not having to actually 
you know, query data, access disks, um, do all of the complex work that goes into rendering a page or an API response and so on. So it's pretty easy to see why routing requests can be much, much faster um, than actually handling requests, uh, which, is, which is why this works at all. Um, and what that does, it improves things more dramatically again, right? So the blue line here is what it looks like, with what, uh, what we call least uh, connections load balancing. Uh, that's just an industry standard term. So what, what the load balancer does is it looks at all of the instances and says, okay, well, which instance has the least outstanding requests against it at the moment? So we're counting requests to each backend, right, to each instance. And, you know, if three of them have 10 and one of them have eight, one of them has eight, the next request will go to the one that has eight, right? So we're looking at the, uh, we're looking at the server that is the least loaded. Uh, and that pulls everything into being uh, this kind of hockey stick. And so um, this has an even more dramatic effect on P99s. Uh, it, will, it will typically bring the P99 down, P99 down much, much closer to the average. Um, because when you do get occasional outliers, like that monthly report and so on, it'll pretty much go to one server. And it might hog that server for a while while that report is being generated. But it doesn't really impact the other requests. Because now the low balancer is smart enough to know, I'm not going to send anything to that, low, to that guy. He's, he's too busy, right? Uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty good. Um, so this smoothens out and makes things, um, uh, makes a lot of things much, much better, right? It'll, it'll kind of paper over garbage collection. It'll paper over uh, cache misses. It'll paper over just differences in your workload. It, it, it's great like that. But it does have one big dangerous property, right? Which is if you have a backend or an instance that is not handling traffic correctly, so let's say it's returning 500s all the time, doing something harmful, but it's doing it very, very quickly, right? We're going to send all the requests there, right? <laughs> that's, that's, not a, that's it's not a good thing, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to attract, it's going to gravitate all those requests to it almost the very worst place for them. So that's why it's key, as we'll see later, to configure health checks correctly so that we actually know the healthiness of that instance and would avoid sending it requests even though it's the fastest and the least loaded, right? Uh, so that's, that's a really important takeaway. Um, none of this works, as I said, if ELB is itself the bottleneck, right? If, if the requests were getting choked up on ELB itself, um, this, this would fall apart. So we, we ourselves have to scale, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about how we do that. Um, so we have two different ways that we scale um, our load balancers today, uh, both preemptive and reactive. So a preemptive load balancing is that if you register um, some instances behind your load balancer, uh, either directly or through auto scaling groups, uh, we'll assume you're adding those instances for a reason, right? We'll assume you're adding those instances because you're expecting a workload. Um, you're going you're gonna to do something with them. And we'll go ahead and preemptively scale the ELB to match, right? So we'll make the ELB at, at least as large, uh, more likely twice as large uh, as whatever you scale to because of our uh, availability zone configurations. Um, and we'll do that very quickly. Um, generally within two minutes. Uh, and uh, we'll keep it like that for at least 24 hours. So even if, you, even if you don't send us any load, even if nothing happens, we'll, we'll leave it that high for at least the next 24 hours. After 24 hours, we'll kind of slowly ramp down and go back to our predictive model uh, or reactive model. And, and the way the reactive model works is we actually look at the load that's coming into the load balancer like how many requests you're getting, how many packets per second you're getting, uh, how many bytes per second, all of these things, in and out, various parameters. If you're using SSL, we'll look at how much CPU is being consumed by uh, all of the various SSL parameters and so on. And we'll, and we'll scale the ELB to, to, to match that. We've got pretty healthy uh, safety margins. Um, on top of that, we actually scale every ELB so that we could lose an entire availability zone's worth of capacity 
at a moment's notice and still be fully scaled to respond to your load. So there's, there's quite a bit of, uh, of, of safety margin in there. Um, and this is something we've done a lot of work on, just improving steadily and steadily over the last two years um, to the point now where um, the system scales so rapidly that we've seen uh, people handling like, large Super Bowl style events and uh, you know, everybody hitting us at once, advertisement links and so on, um, without needing to do anything special. Right? The system will just uh, scale to match it. It's, it's, um, it. it's pretty neat to see. Uh, you can also use ELB to help scale your own instances. Right? We, um, we provide 13 CloudWatch metrics with every uh, elastic low bouncer. We'll talk about them in a while. But uh, all of those can be used to trigger auto-scaling as well. So if, if your load can be scaled on a parameter that corresponds to one of those metrics, so a really common one is just requests right, or bytes, um, rather than having to build that metric yourself or, or do any kind of aggregation, you can just use the metric that comes from ELB. And you can say, well, scale my auto-scaling auto group based on what the ELB in front of it is seeing, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat. Um, it's, uh, um, it is important to choose the right metrics, right? You need insight into your own workload. If you're, if you're very data heavy, right, then maybe bytes per second is more appropriate than requests per second. On the other hand, if you're very CPU intensive and you've got a lot of work per request, but they're not necessarily large, um, then requests are the way to go. And you've got to make that decision based on your own workload uh, and what you think works best in your environment. Um, the, um, as I mentioned, there's 13 uh, CloudWatch metrics. Uh, there's things like I just mentioned, like uh, requests and bytes. But there's also ones around the health of the low balancer itself, how we're doing in terms of response times, uh, and so on. Everything's provided a one-minute granularity, so they're pretty live, pretty up-to-date, uh, help, help respond to things in real time. Um, and you can configure alarms uh, on everything if you'd like to. Um, so one that's particularly interesting is the healthy host count metric. So that actually exposes our view of your instance health, right? So you've got instances behind the low balancer. Hopefully you've got health checks configured. We're health checking them all the time. This metric tells you, okay, well, we're currently seeing seven of your, your instances healthy out of 10, say. And you can look at that on a zonal basis. You can look at that on a... Um, you can, look, you can look at the aggregate, too, across the low balancer. Uh, it's pretty neat. Um, if you want to see how the performance of your site's doing, uh, you can look at our latency metrics. So here we measure a bunch of different time values. We measure the time requests come into the ELB, and then we send it to the instance. We look at the, request, the time that the, uh, the instance takes to respond and so on. Uh, and we provide you with the min and max and average and, and so on of all those numbers. And you can get a sense for the overall responsiveness um, of your site, site at the moment and see how that's going. Uh, if, if you want really super granular detail in indiv individual requests, that's where access logs will come in. I'll cover that in a bit. Um, we also expose surge queue and spillover metrics. Um, so the surge queue is just an internal queue and buffer of requests that the ELB will hold on to um, when uh, your instances are refusing them. Right? So let's say uh, you've got some instances in the low balancer. We send them some requests, but then they, they run out of their own capacity. We haven't quite auto-scaled yet, so we don't have another instance we can send, um, uh, send traffic to. Uh, we'll actually just buffer up to 1,000 of them uh, just hold on to them for, uh, for a short while, and then if, a, if, if an instance does become available again, we'll, we'll replay them, uh, and we'll, we'll send them there, and we can recover. Uh, spillover is when we can't even do that, right? When your instances are overwhelmed, they're not keeping up with the request rate, uh, we've nowhere left to send traffic, the surge queue fills, um, then we spill over, which essentially means we start returning 503s uh, on your behalf. That's our last resort. Uh, hopefully, at that point, your client might be able to do something smart, like maybe try an alternative site or do exponential back off in case the client is constantly retrying and overloading the site or something like that. 
Um, but both of these metrics, they're, they're really useful to look at. They're generally a sign that your uh, instances are underscaled and you either need to put them on larger instance types or auto scale to, to uh, just more of them. Um, but they're, they're super useful to, to have, great thing to configure alarms on. Um, so access logs, all right. Here's uh, the secret key to, to all of these fields. You'll find this in our documentation too. Um, but on a per request level, we're exposing pretty much everything that's in one of those uh, 30 metrics. And then Cypher Suite and SSL uh, protocol version, uh, which, we, which we just added. Um, and you can do some really neat stuff with these, right? Um, uh, something I like to do with these is I will, I'll sometimes just write simple scripts that go through the access logs and I'll find, you know, what are the slowest requests? Like I'll just order them very simple awk shell script and say, well, here's my you know, top 10 or bottom 10, depending on which way you want to view it, uh, worst requests. Um, what are they, right? And I'll, I'll dig in and I'll, and I'll go, why is this request so slow? And it's a, it's a great way to uncover subtle problems in systems, a great way to view the data. Um, another thing you use it for, you could replay requests, right? If, you've, if you're trying to validate a new stack or a new architecture, you've got this great repository of you know, requests real people generated uh, that you can try against the new stack and, um, and see how that goes. As I mentioned earlier, we upload these uh, to S3 either once every five minutes or, or once an hour, uh, whichever you prefer. You can, you can choose it either way. Um, if you're worried about S3 storage costs, you can also uh, use S3 uh, data lifecycle policies and so on so that you only keep however much data you're comfortable with, you know, a day or... And, two days or a year, whatever, whatever it is you, uh, you feel is the right choice for you. Uh, from my own instance, I've kept every log ever. And it's a pretty small number of requests, so I'm fine with that. <laughs> um, if um, you need to scale beyond even a single region, that is something uh, we support. Um, so ELB has integration with uh, Amazon Route 53, our DNS service, um, where if either for very availability critical operations or uh, very latency sensitive operations, you can use Route 53's latency based routing or now geographic based routing to take you know, different parts of the world and send requests to different regions and have ELBs, um, ELBs in those regions uh, handle them, right? Which is pretty neat. Um, all right, so none of this matters, right? If we don't actually keep the website up. If we don't, um, if we don't keep, uh, if we don't keep things going, Route 53 plays a pretty important role there, as we'll see. But the first kind of big availability benefit, <coughs> sorry, that I wanted to point out, um, which is something that is uh, so obvious it never occurred to me until I uh, started talking to customers about it is that having a load balancer in front of your instance um, means you can do upgrades and replacements without downtime, right? So it really surprised me the number of customers I spoke to who just told me, well, the, one of the biggest reasons they use an ELB is so that, you know, it used to be they would upgrade their software or they would replace the stack. They'd have to schedule it at 2 in the morning and... You know, there'd be a 10-minute interruption as one server went away and another came back and they made some DNS changes and all those things and so on. Uh, how we handle things is a little different. When you deregister an ELB, or sorry, when you deregister an instance from an ELB, or when the health checks on that instance start failing, we won't send any new traffic to it, but the old stuff stays going, right? If there are any connections in flight to that instance, we'll keep them alive. So you can just register a new instance It'll start getting traffic pretty much straight away. And you can watch traffic drain on the old instance. And when it's done, it's done, right? No downtime. Pretty great way to keep availability. This all works partially because of health checks, right? So health checks, probably the most important part of um, getting the availability configuration correct behind an ELB, right? So when you, when you add instances to the ELB, you can define a health check. They can be 
as simple as can we connect to a TCP port, or as complex as nope, this is a full HTTPS request, has to get a 200 response to be considered healthy, right? And again, these are something you've got to be um, diligent about and smart about in terms of it matching your workload and what's appropriate for your site, right? So for example, if your application depends on, a, on say, a database, right, then maybe your health check should check if the database is alive, right, and shouldn't be returning 200 if, if the database is having a problem. Because um, maybe it's better to fail the health check and have the load go elsewhere to a different instance that's using a different database, um, and everything can, be, uh, everything can be better. The, uh, the thing I like about health checks, too, is that they're, they're kind of always happening all the time um, in the data plane, right? So they're uh, incredibly reliable. Right? They're a really, 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 really reliable way of making sure that if there's a problem, it won't spread. Um, another thing that's worth paying close attention to is our idle timeouts. So we let you configure the idle timeout, the default 60 seconds. You can set it, raise it up to an hour. And that's how long we will keep a connection alive, um, even if there is no traffic on that connection. So this is useful if you're using um, Keep Alive connections. So if, the, if an instance responds to us with a connection Keep Alive header and says, you know, it's safe to, to reuse this connection, which helps with latency, because it avoids all those setup costs, especially if you're using SSL. It takes four round trips um, to establish a connection to the back end. Um, so it is a time saver. Um, but you've got to be careful with this value, because idle timeouts also kick in if, you know, if your system just pauses or crashes um, and it's just in a hanged state. You want to you kill any connections that are genuinely idle, right? that there's really a problem with. Um, so you want this value to match whatever is appropriate for your site. You also want to think about like, what's going to happen when clients retry, right? So if you've got one idle timeout in your system that's saying, you know, keep connections open for an hour, but your client has an idle timeout that's set up for like, well, just 60 seconds, well, what's going to happen is the client's going to abandon it at 60 seconds, but because that setting on the inside is still an hour, you know, we might keep that work going even though there's no client around uh, to listen for it anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'd always recommend setting up staggered idle timeouts that get smaller and smaller the further you are from the client, right, to avoid that uh, uh, effect. Avoids um, cascading failures, which is, which is pretty cool. The other kind of leg of availability is using multiple availability zones. So, on ELB, we will always, always provision ELBs in multiple availability zones, even if you're only using one uh, yourself, your own instances. Um, so when you create an ELB in a VPC, you give us a subnet in each availability zone, and that's where we'll actually launch the ELB. We have Route 53 sitting in front um, of, of our availability zones using DNS health checks as a protection mechanism. So if an availability zone were to have, say, a power outage and so on, um, what's actually happening is that um, the Route 53 health checks will kick in, detect that, and take it out of service without us having to do anything, right? So when the availability zone fails, we're not going and making any changes or, or doing anything complicated at all. The DNS system is just saying, stop returning, stop returning those IP addresses, please, which is great. Uh, that's another example of the kind of constant work factor pattern in general that we see with health checks, whether it's those Route 53 health checks or our health checks towards your instances, where instead of a system where when things go wrong, we suddenly start making a bunch of API calls and generating a bunch of changes, you know, that may or may not succeed in the heat of an event, we have systems that just do the same amount of work all the time, uh, whether things are, are, are healthy or unhealthy. Um, the, uh, as I said, you need to register different subnets, a subnet per zone, in order for us to, to be able to balance them. Um, this all comes with one slight challenge, though, which is because we're doing uh, simple DNS load balancing in front of ELB at the availability zone level, we're using round-robin load balancing effectively there, 
we, you can see imbalances in load between the availability zones. So here, for example, we've got three availability zones, and the green one's getting more traffic uh, than the other two. The reason for that is there may be very few uh, DNS servers uh, that are actually being queried, and so one is sticky and one gets more, goes to uh, the green availability zone. Um, this is because, sorry, this is generally not because DNS TTLs aren't being honored. It's generally just because there, uh, sometimes like mobile networks in particular, there just may only be three main servers in play. Uh, we do have a workaround for this. I'm not gonna go through it in detail. I include it on the slide in case you're interested in it. You can, um, you can grab it later. But it essentially uses wildcards and C names and it's a crazy embarrassing hack. Uh, but does work to essentially bust caches uh, on mobile resolvers if you really, really need to. We have a few people doing this on mobile apps. Um, but what we generally recommend here is just enable cross zone null balancing, right? So if you enable cross zone null balancing, then our ELB in availability zone D here, for example, uh, can actually route to instances in the other availability zone. And so the load converges, right? With cross zone null balancing enabled, we see a more even spread of requests uh, between the availability zone. Um, which is, uh, which, is, which is pretty neat. We, we effectively end up absorbing that imbalance that comes out uh, because of DNS caching, um, which is pretty neat. And then the very last thing I wanted to cover is some, something we're seeing um, more and more of, which is just ELB and DevOps. Um, so today, we're, we're already tightly integrated with uh, CloudFormation and OpsWorks. Um, if you use Elastic Beanstalk, you can get ELBs that way. Uh, you, you'd be using us through container service or API gateway or even third-party tools like Netflix, Asgard, and so on. There's a lot of automation and systems built around uh, spinning up and managing ELBs. Um, we're seeing a lot of people do blue-green deployments using ELB as their gateway, as their latch mechanism of how to switch. Um, and lastly, because all of this can be done programmatically um, with, with cloud trail logs and so on. Uh, and rollback, we're seeing um, more people create whole stacks with a new ELB at the top and then do flips. And that's something we're building uh, tighter and tighter support for, making sure that ELBs are provisioned ever more quickly um, to support those workloads. Uh, and that's the final section, that's scalability. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, hopefully you've learned some, some things about how low balancing works uh, and some things that can be applied in your workloads. Thank you.